chapter 5, and Jesus was essentially giving them witnesses that testified to his deity, to him being God. So he's, he's, he's been in that. And then uh, the first miracle we're going to look at, Jesus feeding the 5,000. We're going to look at that. And what's awesome about this miracle in particular is outside of the resurrection itself, it's the only miracle listed in all four Gospels. So all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all speak about this miracle. And so as, uh, after I read this, I'm going to build up the story and use a lot of what we read uh, from their eyewitness accounts as well. So let's read John uh, 6, verses 1 through 9. It says this, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Okay, so so what we see, first of all, at the beginning of chapter 6, it kicks off with saying this, After this Jesus went. To the other side. So, so after this, now why am I highlighting that? Well, I'm highlighting that because this, when it's saying this phrase, it doesn't mean that these events that we're going to look at immediately preceded what we read about in chapter five. Okay, so all it's saying there by saying that is that these events that we're looking at, they happened after that at some point in time. Okay, in fact, when we look at verse 4 of what we just read, it says these events took shortly before what? Before Passover. If you remember, at the beginning of chapter 5, in chapter 5, 1, it talked about this feast that they were celebrating. But it didn't specify what feast it was. And, and, and so if it was the Feast of Tabernacles that they were celebrating in chapter 5, it means that there was a six-month gap between chapter 5 and chapter 6. If that feast was actually Passover that they were celebrating, then it means a whole year occurred between chapter 5 and chapter 6. Now, that's important because what we uh, read about is Jesus was continuing to minister all throughout Galilee during this time gap, whether it was for six months or a year, and it's recorded in the other Gospels. So we know that he was healing, he was was preaching and teaching, and this also helps to explain why there's such a large crowd that's here at the beginning of chapter 6, wanting to be around Jesus and wanting to follow him. Now, now, when we look at the Sea of Galilee, it was also known as the Sea of Tiberias. It had a couple other names as well that it was referred to. But uh, when he talks about uh, going to the other side, that would be the east side of the lake. Since the most populated side was the western side uh, of the lake, he, he's taking his disciples and they're going to this more remote area, this, this less populated uh, place. And, and, and what, we, what we see uh, as to the reason why they're doing this is, is more so explained uh, in the other Gospels, one of the things that we see uh, that Mark speaks to in Mark chapter 6 is his disciples had just been sent out on this mission. Jesus had sent them out two by two to go and gave them power and authority to heal, uh, to preach. And so uh, essentially it's like their big first mission without Jesus by their sides. And so they go and they do that. And, and it's incredible, but towards the end of that, they're tired, they're exhausted, uh, and, and, and they need a debrief, right? Like if you've ever done a project or a certain mission of some kind, um, 
There was a time of debrief. How did it go? What did you learn? And so, and so Jesus is, is saying, you guys need to get away. Let, let's go and, and really get some rest and debrief what happened. But what we also find out in um, Matthew 14, 13, is that also Jesus has just found out that his relative and good friend, John the Baptist, has been executed. And so he's heard that news. So, so he is in this place, in this posture of mourning. He's grieving over, over his friend, over his relative, this, this incredible man of influence who paved the way for Jesus. And, and so it's in that place that Jesus and his disciples, they're weary, uh, they're, they're exhausted. They go to get away. You ever been there? They just need to get away. And, 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 and walk through some stuff with the Father. And so they're crossing by sea uh, in this boat. And as they're crossing, there is a large crowd that is following them from all the local villages and cities. This, this, this crowd is following them along the shoreline. And so when they arrive, not only is there already a crowd there, but there was more people on their way. And, and, and so... We also see that they were following Jesus. Why? They were following him because of the miracles. Right? So they weren't following him because they're, they're, they're like receiving him as their Lord and Savior. No, they're following him. Like we talked about last week, they're following him because of the show. They're following him because they're watching people get healed and they've never seen that. And, and so uh, they're there to watch and, and, and to see uh, what everybody's talking about. And so Jesus goes up to the mountain with his disciples and, and they sit down and I don't know how far into the conversations they got, but Jesus notices a large crowd coming up the hill. And in, and in Mark, it says that when Jesus saw them coming up the hill, it says that he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Guys, there's just something different there. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm emotionally spent, I'm exhausted, and I'm grieving, the last thing I want to do, just being honest, is be around people. Especially a bunch of people. Right? I just want to get away and deal with that. And, and you know what? Yeah, maybe if some people want to come to me that, that, that either I have close relationship with or that love me or family members and, and we go through that together, you know, that's one thing. But, but a whole crowd of people coming to me and, and they, one, they don't even care and two, it's all superficial. Now, how do you respond in that moment? Get away, right? But what's so different about Jesus is he's able to look at those people as he is literally grieving, he's exhausted, he's given already so much, and he's able to look at them and find compassion. Why? Because he could see that they were directionless. They had no savior. They had no one leading them. And so he was able to find compassion in that and outside of their superficial walk, their superficial uh, desires to even be around him. He was able to look beyond all of that and see to the core of who they were and see that they were directionless and they needed a savior. They needed a shepherd. You guys, that's a huge transition for us to get to when we're able to look at people outside of their failures, their shortcomings, their lifestyles, and and be able to look at them with compassion, understanding and knowing that they are directionless. Understanding that they don't have a shepherd leading them. And so that's a huge thing that Jesus modeled. And so he receives these people. It talks about how he healed the sick. He was preaching to them. And then as the day uh, is ending, uh, the, the disciples come up to him and they say, listen, there's no food to eat here. Send these people away. So they can go into the villages and buy their own food and eat. Everybody's tired. And then we see Jesus look at Philip and say, where are we to buy bread 
so that these people may eat. Now, we don't know why he was singling out Philip. Now, Philip does. But we don't know why. We don't know if Philip oversaw the administrative tasks and, and those things uh, for the 12. But he singles out Philip. And, and what we see is he is testing Philip, it says. He's testing him. See, he already knew what he was going to do. He already knew the miracle he was going to perform. But he's testing him. And not only him, but he's testing all of the disciples here to, to, to test the strength of their faith. Not only is he testing the strength of their faith, but he's strengthening their faith at the same time. And we know this because of what the Bible talks about when it, when it speaks to trials and, and these tests and, and temptations. In James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, I love how he writes this. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing he says count it joy count it joy when you when you literally go through these various tri trials and and, and and these things that are going to challenge you count it as joy and I always read that and I remember I'd be like how right because I don't know about you, maybe I was just never that spiritual, but man, when a trial came, I was never like, man, praise God. This is awesome. I lost my job. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. God, you're good. Right? That's tough. But in the midst of this, he says he's producing something. He's producing this steadfastness. Now, now, now we go, man, that's a good thing. So he's producing this steadfastness, and ultimately it's this process where he's taking us to this completion, uh, this place of lacking uh, nothing, which is exciting. First Peter uh, chapter 1, 6 and 7, it speaks to the same thing, where it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You guys, these trials, these tests, they are an opportunity to validate your faith and to grow your faith. That is consistently what we see in scripture. It authenticates your faith like nothing else. It reveal where, where, where it's actually at, what it's resting in. Uh, and, and, and also it grows your faith like nothing else can do. And that's the consistent messaging when we read about trials and tests in scripture. And, and so if, like, if, if you're following Jesus, I want to encourage you in that. Now, now, me saying that, it doesn't make it easier, right? It's tough. It's difficult. In fact, if you're praying, God, grow my faith, be prepared. He tells you how he grows our faith, right? And, and, and so we just need to know, though, that as he's doing this, it's ultimately for his good. And it's ultimately for your good. Philip responds to Jesus saying, hey, how, you know, we want to go feed these people uh, to master. This would cost more than 200 denarii. And, 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 and master, 200 denarii is only enough for not even, well, not even a bite for all of them. Okay, teacher. A denarius is, is one day's wage, right? So 200 is like eight months' salary. And so he's, he's like, listen, if we spend even eight months' salary, not everybody's going to get a bite, okay? Listen, I know you're really smart, Jesus, but that's what we're dealing with. That's the reality, okay? And, and, and so what we see here is they didn't have the money, and even if they did, where are they going to get all of this bread? Human wisdom says this is a problem that can't be solved. 
It can't be solved. And what this is, you guys, is a reminder to us that we're always going to be confronted with problems that are too big for us to solve, that we're going to be powerless to solve. You are, regardless of how advanced we get, tech, you know, from a technological standpoint and everything else in our culture and our society, and man, we're getting, man, it's amazing what we're doing, but I'm telling you, the thing that is consistent is you will still run into problems that are beyond your ability in your human nature to solve. You just will. That's not going away. And, and, and so that, like, we have this decision, um, and, and usually what we do in those decisions is we respond like Philip, right? We, we, you know, we're smart, we know what it takes to achieve the task, to fulfill it, to accomplish it, and if, if, it's, if it's impossible in our minds, it's, it's, a no, it's no deal. It doesn't work. Right, So we're very quick uh, to, to go down that road. Why? Because, you guys, that's how we've been essentially programmed to think, right? That's how you've been rewarded as you've grown up. It's been about what you can accomplish in figuring things out. So when there's a decision, when there is a, a something that you're facing that's really tough, you immediately go to you. And, and some of you are really good at solving problems. In fact, some of you are so good at it, you lead teams that solve problems. But regardless of where you're at on that spectrum and how uh, people look up to you for being able to do that, you will hit a wall, an obstacle that in your power you cannot overcome. And so what are we going to do? Well, are we going to respond like Philip and not only look to only what we know and can understand, but you guys will also... Philip didn't do is he forgot who was standing right next to him. He forgot. See, Jesus asked Philip this question so he'd learn that there is no problem that supersedes Jesus' power. And so Philip's response reflected ultimately when we respond in this way, we're saying to God that this problem, this trial is actually greater than your power. That's what we're declaring. And so we see that, that his lack of faith is revealed in his response even after all the miracles he's observed Jesus do already. We see another disciple, uh, Andrew, who's Simon Peter's brother. He brings forward a boy with five barley loaves and two fish. Okay, now, now we know from the other accounts that the disciples went out to try and find some people with food. And so Andrew comes, and, and you know, if we just read that, uh, you know, that first part, we go, man, that's great faith that Andrew has. He went and he brought and he believed in this child, in this child's lunch. Right? Now, now listen, when you read this, you need to understand because it says loaves. And so we're thinking like this child's carrying around loaves. And, and massive fish like you guys catch in the ocean for lunch. Okay, that's not what it is, all right? His, his loaf, uh, his barley loaf, because, and, and a barley loaf was, was, was something that the poorer people uh, had to eat. It was literally like a biscuit. I mean, it was like a Twinkie. Now, Twinkie would have been, that would have been, right? We would have been, okay. But like a biscuit, a little cake, and then and then the fish, I mean, these fish were just like to help with the flavor, to help with the taste, right? So, so this is this little boy, uh, his lunch, essentially, just, just imagine you grabbing a little boy with their lunchbox and bringing them to Jesus. And, and at first we're like, man, he's got great faith. But unfortunately, it tells us what else he said. He says what? But what are they for so many? Right? So here you go, Jesus. Don't know what you're going to do with this. Here's a lunchbox, okay? Now, before we knock the disciples, which, man, that's easy to do, right? How many times do we have to see God work before we stop doubting? How many times, you guys? How many times do we have to see him 
work, affirm who he is, affirm his power, affirm that he loves you, uh, 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 affirm uh, that, that he's more than enough for you, all of these things. How many times does he have to do that before we'll stop doubting? Listen, I don't know, but I'm just being honest. I still struggle with doubt, you guys. And so I can't sit here and look at them and, and, and just go, man, what's wrong with you guys? Because there's so many times that I operate in my flesh. There's so many times I just see what's possible that I think I could overcome. And if I can't do that, then I'm just like Andrew. And I'm like, well, here's what I have, God. Good luck with that. And he's like, Steve, you've forgotten. You've forgotten. So we see no one responded by affirming the power of Jesus to provide in this miracle. And then in verses 10 through 15, it says this. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So instead of reprimanding his disciples for their lack of faith, uh, what does Jesus do? He instructs them. He says, he says listen, I want you to go and have the people uh, sit down. And we actually see in the other accounts that they sit the people in groups of 50 and groups of hundreds. And as you think about them seating people, uh, you know, in all the Gospels that alludes to 5,000 men, uh, between women and children, this number is actually probably anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people that are there. And so there they are in this setting, and, and his disciples, his closest followers, don't have any faith, and Jesus just instructs them to go and have the people sit down. Now here's, here's what I see here that, that, that encourages me and also challenges me is the disciples clearly struggled with their faith, right? They're clearly in this moment not believing that Jesus can do all that he says he can. But what are they also doing? They're obeying him. They're still doing what he asks them to do. Guys, this is a big one for us because there are going to be seasons and maybe ones right now where your faith is going to waver, you're going to have doubts, you're going to have questions, and, and, and you're going to be discouraged. And it's, it's in those moments that I challenge you to cling to obedience. Okay? To cling to just obeying his word. Clinging to what you know he says to do. Because there's going to be seasons in life where that obedience is going to carry you through when your faith is lacking. Just as there's times in your life where your faith is strong, you can conquer the world, God is everything, and he's above all things, and you're rallying there, and in those moments, your obedience follows that faith. But, the, but I find, especially right now in our culture, man, we're struggling with our faith, but we're, abandon, we're abandoning obedience as well. And, and what I see is, is, is his disciples, man, as many shortcomings as they had, they continued to be obedient to him. And so what happened? You guys, because they were able to override their lack of faith and obey him, even in that moment, they got to sit there and be a part of one of the greatest miracles we could ever read about. And so you guys, when your faith wavers, hold on to what is true. Follow him, even in that. You can have to, if you're married, you've got to make the same decision in your marriage. Because there's times that you feel in love and there's times you don't. So what do you do when you don't feel in love? All right, we're done. No. Right? I pray not. We work through what we know is true. We hold on to that and we know if we're faithful in that. God will bring those other things. We know that and when it comes to your obedience, God will bring the faith if you remain obedient to him. If you continue to trust him and follow him, he will bring your faith. 
So Jesus is there and everyone's seated and then he starts literally and we don't know what it looked like. I wish we did. But he just starts handing it out. I don't know if he was breaking it. I don't know if he's cutting it. I don't know. But he just kept and they just kept delivering. Just kept going. And you can just imagine the disciples whispering to each other, are you seeing this? Can you believe what's going on right now? And they're delivering this food and all the people, I mean, it's probably just silence. I mean, at first they're like, that's cool, great trick. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, what is happening? We're all eating. And it says they all ate till they were full. And then, because Jesus doesn't waste, Jesus says, hey, go pick up whatever is left over. And so his disciples go and guess how many baskets there are? Twelve. What a coincidence, right? Twelve full baskets for them. And you got to imagine as they're all walking back, they're looking at each other and they're just shaking their heads. What were we thinking? Why would we doubt that? And so they're coming back with these baskets before Jesus and, and, and amazed by the miracle as well as all of these, uh, these people. And, and, and as they see this, they say what? This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. That's what they said. And, and so what they're talking about is he's the prophet that the nation of Israel had been anticipating all these years. Remember, I read this last week uh, where Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 18, 15. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers it is to him you shall listen so a special prophet was going to come and do signs and wonders just as Moses did and century after century this nation has been waiting and waiting for, the, for this prophet like Moses to appear and here he is in Jesus they recognize the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so what do they do? He's here. It says they plan to, by force, make him their king. Now remember what time it is, right? It's Passover time. You guys, Passover time is what? When they celebrated all together them being rescued from Egypt. Right? That's like, so it's like when you think about how we relate, it's like, man, 4th of July, right? 4th of July, Independence Day, flags everywhere, like, yeah, America. And, and, and that on steroids is Passover for them. And they're all together, literally processing, thinking about God's deliverance out of slavery in Egypt through the power that he did in Moses. And now the prophet is here. Look at his authority. Look at his power. Look at the miracles. And just as we needed freedom from Egypt, we are now needing freedom from Rome. It all lines up. Here we go. You guys, if we were there, we'd be drinking that Kool-Aid too. We would all be rallying, ready to go, make him king. It is time. Guys, scripture lines this up. Here we go. Like, like, and, and so Jesus is seeing this revolution in their eyes, and what does he do? He leaves. Right? He leaves. He gets away. He sends the disciples away, and he withdrew to the mountain by himself because Jesus ultimately came to wage war against sin and death, not Rome. See, there was going to be a crucifixion before there would be a coronation. They would follow Jesus as their king as long as he did what they wanted, as long as he would overthrow Rome. Guys, that's not Christianity. Jesus doesn't come to us on our terms. Okay, like, you know, if, if you've ever been in a different country and been in a market and you were negotiating prices with people or just you pulled into a lot at a dealership, right? And you pull in and, and for me, we look at each other, me and my spouse, uh, I don't know why I said that, my wife, and, 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 and we have that agreement, right? We will only spend this much. All right, you ready? You know, and it's like a big deal. It's like you're going to war almost. Now, if you sell cars, we love you. Everything's great. We all need cars, so keep it going. But you have this mentality, right? 
Same thing when you get on the phone with your cable company. Same thing that, 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 that you do if you're going to purchase a house, right? We have to negotiate so that we come out as the beneficiary, right? You want to get back into your new car at the end of the day and look at your spouse and go, yeah, we won. We won, right? Guys, here's what's so dangerous about that. We do the same thing entering into a relationship with Jesus. We literally think we, have, we can negotiate the terms for him getting us. What in the world? Really? I'm going to follow you. I, I'm close. I'm right there. And you could nudge me, Jesus, if this works out. I'm ready. You can have me. If this works out, if you can take this away, this sickness, I'm all yours. If you can uh, fix this situation that I got myself into, uh, you know, if, if you can make this happen, if you can add a few zeros to my bank account. Whatever, like, and, and, and so we literally, now we don't say that, but internally that's essentially what we're doing. We're saying to him that we're gonna negotiate the terms of him saving us. You guys, Jesus never came to meet you on your terms. We only come to him by meeting him on his terms. And you better thank him for it. Because guess what? He doesn't need you. Maybe someone told you that. He doesn't. Okay? But we need him. You need him. I need him. And I'm so thankful that that he says, put your terms away, receive me on my terms, because guess what, guys? How many times have we said, well, if this happens, if he delivers here, or if this works out, everything's gonna be great, but in reality, it didn't work out. In fact, in reality, the very thing that we thought we needed that would equate to success or happiness, it actually didn't do that. And I'm so thankful that, that we don't get to define the terms because we don't even know what's best for us. The people here, they thought safety from Rome, being rescued, conquering Rome, that that would provide happiness. And literally Jesus is is concerned about their eternal salvation. Man, what's greater? And and, and so uh, these people had no clue what was the best for them. Guys, we have no clue what is the best for us. He knows the desires in your heart. He he built you. He, He knows you. He loves you. And it's out of his grace and his goodness that he offers salvation. And so if you're, if, man, if you've heard this like get rich quick, I would call it get the gospel quick scheme where, hey, he just exists. And if you do it, this immediately will happen. This immediately, guys, man, stop. You're, you're, you're negotiating the terms. That's not what this is about. That's not the gospel. That is upside down from the gospel. And when you do receive him, you do find out that he is far greater than anything you could imagine. But surrender your expectations. Surrender your desires to him and allow him to define and dictate that. We see in in verses 16 uh, through 21, it says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So Jesus dismisses the crowd, right? And, and, and he also uh, sends his disciples away. And, and you gotta imagine, guys, he's also sending his disciples away to protect them from that moment because in that moment, they're probably with the crowd as well. Right? Jesus had already told them when he was teaching them how to pray in Matthew 6.10, pray that my kingdom would come and my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they're watching this happen to, to literally uh, the one that they serve. And, and they're sitting there going, oh, finally he's getting his due. Finally they're acknowledging who he really is. And there they are. They're excited about this moment. They see how it aligns with scripture. And so you got to believe they're right there with the crowd on the 
verge of forcing him as the king. And Jesus is seeing this and he's like, you guys need to go away. You're missing it. So he sends them away. And then, and then in the evening, they go out on this boat and they're headed to Capernaum. Okay, And so they go and they're cutting across the sea uh, towards Capernaum. And we read uh, that the seas uh, became very, very rough. There was, a, there was a great wind that started to blow, which is, is known to happen in the Sea of Galilee. And, and, and so the water is getting more and more rough, and, and, they're, and they're literally like going against the wind. And, and, and so we see that as they're, as they're doing this, like literally they left Capernaum around uh, anywhere between 6 and 9 p.m. And according to Matthew and Mark's account, it was now the fourth watch. In other words, it's anywhere from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's a tough night. And they're fighting. They're fighting through the wind. They're exhausted. And they're only halfway. They're only in the middle of the sea. And they're in that place. It's dark. They're weary. And suddenly they see somebody or something walking on the sea towards their boat. And, you know, with the darkness and all the elements and the waves and the wind, they, they don't recognize that it's Jesus. They just see this figure walking towards their boat on the water. Now, many of these disciples are like, I mean, these are trained professional fishermen, right? So, so they're used to rough seas. They're used to being out on the lake at night. But this, right? They're not used to this. This is crazy. None of you should read this and go, oh, that's great that that happened. No, you should stop and go, this is crazy. Matthew 14, 26, it tells us what they did. It says, but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. See, there is no natural explanation for what they're seeing. They're literally like, are you seeing this? I don't, have we been out that long? Like, what is going on? Here he's coming, and, 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 and what they're confronted with is a power that was so beyond their reasoning. They were being confronted with the very power of God, and they were afraid. And Jesus, as he, as he approaches, he calms them down and says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Ah, it's, it's me. Do not be afraid. Recognizing finally that it's Jesus, they are gladly willing to receive him into their boat. But before he gets into the boat, we see bold and impulsive Peter call out to Jesus. In Matthew 14, 28 through 31, it says, And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And this is pretty crazy. And Peter, that impulsive, bold guy, he's like, hey, if it's you, call me out there. I'm walking to you. Jesus says, come on probably like this, come on. And Peter jumps out and he's walking on the water, but what happens, you guys, what happens? We see this fear. Guys, I'm telling you right now, fear will absolutely rob, steal, and destroy what God is trying to do in your life, if you allow it. Fear will absolutely destroy you. Now, how does fear happen? Well, fear happens, there's, there's a couple. Well, one is we take our eyes and our focus off of Jesus. Okay, so any time, every single time I'm in a place, a posture of fear, my eyes are taken off of Jesus. He's not my focal point anymore. Now, how does that happen? Well, there's one or two ways, right? I'm either, as we talked about the last few weeks, I'm either distracted, right? We can just be so distracted so all of a sudden, we've been kind of drifting away from God, and then all of a sudden, we're being met with this fear, and it's because we're distracted. We're not dialed in, locked into him. Or it's the other way, which is this, the, the fear is actually consuming us. What I mean by that is this fear literally has a hold of your mind and your heart. 
to where it's all you can do. It's all you can think about. And even when you're like, I'm giving this up to God, you're still consumed with it. You're still like every prayer, God, you know I don't want to do that. Help me not to do that, God. I'm done with that. As you read in the Bible, God, help me not do that. God, help me not to to think about that. Now, what happens when you try really hard not to think about something? What do you do? I know what I do. I'm thinking about it. It's dominating me. Right? That, 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 and, and so what happens, and you may even be doing all the right things. You may be going to church. You may be reading your Bible. You may be praying. But that still is controlling you. See, it's, it, it's literally, you can't even have a conversation to focus on God because it's there. You can't, you can't read his word and really receive it because it all comes back to this that you're trying not to do. And when you sit in a setting like this, it's all about don't focus on that. Don't focus on that. You guys, you have to choose what you're going to focus on, not continue to focus on what you're trying not to focus on. You can't move forward while still looking back. You just can't. And I see that so often. And, 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 and what's so confusing about us when we find ourselves in the space of fear is, is, is we're confused because we're doing the things that, that churches tell us to do, that Steve told me to do. Read your Bible, pray. I'm, I'm doing all those things, but why? You're still allowing it to consume you, you guys. And until you make Jesus your focal point, until your eyes are fixed on him, not what you're trying not to be, but literally who you're trying to become, until that's where you're at, you're gonna continue to go do this. And you're gonna continue to experience fear. And, and, and the warning here is look at what happened with Peter. I mean, you want to talk about the coolest thing that I've seen? Walking on water's got to be up there. And it derailed it like that, you guys. Your fear will derail what God wants to do in your life so quickly. I challenge you against that. Whether you're distracted, man, get back. If it's just fear that's consuming you over something, or if it's guilt or it's shame over something, man, stop it. That thought has no business based upon what Jesus did. Move forward. With him as your focus. Mark 6, 51, it tells us what happened when he got into the boat. It says, and he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astonished. So Jesus gets into the boat with them, and and the wind just, done. Still, beautiful night. Just like that. And so they're just, but then also what happens? What do we read in John here, in John's account? When he gets in the boat, they are immediately at their destination. I mean, this is like sea calmed land. Right where they need to be. Man. They respond in Matthew 14, 33. It says, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And that's the only response you can do in moments like that. Guys, when you receive Jesus into your life, you realize it's not about a desired destination anymore. You realize he is the desired destination. You realize that you've actually arrived Now, that doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you're not going to struggle, doesn't mean you know everything about him or or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is all these things you thought you needed, you thought were the drive, the focus of your life, when Jesus gets into your boat, when you have that relationship with him, you immediately realize this is it. This is everything. And you see how it just transformed every 
area of your life. And, and, and that's exactly, in, in, in a very real and tangible way, what they're experiencing is that once he is in that place, in your heart, uh, you guys, uh, in your life, you will realize, man, he's the point. He's the purpose. It, it no longer has to be all of these things for me to be defined as a success, for me to be defined as worthy. No more. Uh, it, it's literally receiving him. You understand and realize that he is everything. And there's peace in that. Guys, he, uh, he did both these miracles for the same reason, so that they would witness his power and understand who he is. There is a God that has a, a power that our minds cannot fathom. And yet through his son Jesus, he reaches out to us and he says, you don't need to be afraid. If you believe in Jesus, if you receive him as Lord and Savior, there's no need to fear, to be anxious, or to worry. You don't need to do that. Ephesians 3.20, it tells us why. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Uh, beyond even what you think could solve, beyond even what you could ever hope to do or accomplish, that power's at work inside of you if Jesus is Lord and Savior of your life. You have the power of the Holy Spirit operating and working and pushing you forward. And, and guys, that will drive out fear. Man, if you're living in that, nope. Fear has no place there. A anxiety has no place. Worry has no place there because that's, sp that's a space he's occupying. And, and that power is there available to you. If you're, if you're going through a trial right now, my question is, are you trying to solve it all in your own ability? Or are you remembering that you have Jesus with you and just maybe this trial is designed to grow and to validate your faith? Are you, mem are you, are you remembering that he's with you? And if your faith is shaky, right now, and you're struggling, it's up and down, hold on to obedience. Hold on to obedience to his word and allow that to keep you moving forward even when what is forward seems to be unknown. Trust him. And if you're sitting there and you go, man, I have no one to go to, make a decision today to receive him as Lord and Savior of your life. He loves you guys. He loves you. He's here, he's available, and he's inviting you into relationship with him. Let's pray.